I am super excited for today's video because I get to talk about the best rides in Tokyo Disney. That is so cool. Whether you're planning a trip overseas soon or you just want to see how different the rides are in Tokyo compared to what we've got over here in the States, stay tuned because we're covering it all here on DFB Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. I just got back from Tokyo Disneyland and Disney Sea a couple of weeks ago, and I had an absolute blast. There is so much food and entertainment and amazing merchandise, and of course, state-of-the-art rides and attractions. But I wanted to take y'all inside the Tokyo parks with me today because I wanna show you what rides are completely different from what we're used to in the States, which ones are pretty similar, if not exactly the same, and how you can maximize your time in both Tokyo Disneyland and Tokyo Disney Sea for any and all future bucket list vacations. And I will say this, if it's even something you're considering, definitely step on that gas pedal because those parks are amazing. I know everybody says Disney Sea is the best Disney park. It really is incredible for so many reasons, and so I can't wait to talk to you about it here. Now, two important things before we get started. This top 10 list could and probably will drastically change by next summer because on June 6th, 2024, the new Fantasy Springs expansion is going to open in Tokyo Disney Sea, bringing with it three new themed areas based on Tangled, Frozen, and Peter Pan. And with these new areas, there are going to be lots of new rides that I'm feeling all jittery just talking about because one of them is a Tangled Boat ride and another one shrinks you down to Tinkerbell size to explore Pixie Hollow. And a lot of cool stuff is in the works. And so we'll keep it at that for now. But be prepared for next summer because we'll probably be giving you an updated ride list after the new Tokyo Disney Sea rides go live if I get the chance to go back over there. And if you're super enthralled with all things Tokyo Disney and want to learn more about what makes these parks stand out, go ahead and scan the QR code you see on the screen now or head to disneyfoodblog.com slash Tokyo Disney for a free guide that compares these overseas parks to the ones we've got back in the States. All right, we are going to start out with the ride that everybody probably expects us to start out with. It is the Enchanted Tale of Beauty and the Beast. Now, this is easily the best ride in both the parks. And that's not because all the other rides aren't good, because so many of them are really good. It's just how impressive this Beauty and the Beast themed dark ride is. Enchanted Tale of Beauty and the Beast is located in Tokyo Disneyland and takes place inside Beast's Castle. So after winding your way around the castle corridors, you'll be led to the main foyer to listen to a quick recap of Beast's fate during a stunning pre-show, which is all in Japanese, by the way. <laughs> if you're already familiar with the Beauty and the Beast story, you'll get it. And for the actual ride, you'll board a giant teacup, which will transport you into the story of Belle and Beast. And this is stunning. It is beautiful. The animatronics are top tier. The musical numbers are bubbly and cheery. And in that dining room scene, you've even got Cogsworth inside a big gelatin mold and it's hilarious. And the magical transformation that happens at the very end. I don't even understand it. I don't know how it's done. I've watched it like seven times. It's got to be projection somehow, but I don't get it at all. So for those of you smarty pants who do know, because I know a lot of you do, please just send me a message and let me know because I'm okay with the spoiler. So this one is 10 out of 10. Good for all ages. I actually rode one time with a guy and his baby. So it's perfect for everybody. Now, the one complaint is that it's a massive, massive line. Now that's not surprising at all. The lines start forming for Enchanted Tale even before the park officially opens, since Disney hotel guests will have access to happy entry, which allows them to enter the parks a few minutes early. Now for Enchanted Tale, I'd go ahead and purchase the Premier Access Pass for it to avoid the main queue hassle altogether. Disney's Premier Access Pass in Tokyo is a lot like the individual lightning lanes we have in the States. It allows you to pay for a return time for the most popular Tokyo Disney rides or shows, and you can enter into a much shorter queue when you return. Now, unlike an individual lightning lane where you can only purchase up to two lightning lanes a day, and they must be for different rides, you can pay for however many premier access passes you want, even if that means paying for the same one over and over again. You just have to wait to purchase your next one until after you've used your first one or after 60 minutes have passed since your last premier access purchase. When I was there, the Beauty and the Beast premier access pass was about 2,000 yen on average, which means it was around 12 to $14. 
All right, next up is Soaring Fantastic Flight. Okay, if you've ever ridden Soarin' around the world in Disney California Adventure or Epcot, then Soaring Fantastic Flight in Tokyo Disney Sea is basically the same concept. You're on a flight simulator, you're soaring over the world. While most of the ride footage is a direct copy of what you'll experience in the States, taking you places like Australia and the Grand Canyon, India, etc., the end scenes are where the ride experience becomes different because instead of flying over a nighttime setting of Paris like you'll do on the US versions, you'll fly across Tokyo and the Tokyo Disney Sea Park, which was a fun little switch up. And much like how the soaring queues in DCA and Epcot are different from each other, the soaring fantastic flight is way different from them all, and it is much, much, much cooler. Okay, they don't have Patrick Walburton in theirs, but instead of being themed around taking flight on a hang glider or a plane, the Tokyo Sea version is themed around the Society of Explorers and Adventurers, or the SEA. Now, it'd probably take the rest of the video to describe all the behind the scenes lore of SEA, but in short, this is a fictional organization that can be linked to attractions throughout Disney resorts worldwide. So you'll see references to SEA over in the States too, at attractions like Jungle Cruise and Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. You've got the SEA room at Skipper Canteen. Of course, the Adventurers Club was all SEA infused back when it was in Pleasure Island. So there's a lot of SEA stuff going on across the world. So on Soaring Fantastic Flight, the SEA theming is reflected throughout the parts that are leading up to the main ride itself. The cast members wear costumes that are more Renaissance based than flight attendant based. So you're gonna see the men wearing blue vests, women wearing blue skirts, both of them wearing these neckties and they have SEA logos on their costumes. And the queue is designed to look like a museum, highlighting the prototypes and inventions of flying machines through the ages. Now, the pre-show here is amazing. It features SEA members Member Camelia Falco, who is the mastermind behind the dream flyer you're about to board. Now, okay, Mr. Walburton, I'm gonna have to give extra points to Camelia here for coming to life out of a painting. So if you could learn how to do that too, that would be great. And then there are the ride vehicles themselves designed to look like Da Vinci's flying machines made with bundles of sticks tied together with rope. Very sturdy looking, would absolutely trust it with my life, no worries. Now, while soaring is a great time, no matter where you're riding it, it is wild wildly popular in Tokyo, like way more popular than it is at both Disney California Adventure and Epcot. So the lines here can be hours long for it. It's kind of the ride that everybody runs to over in Disney Sea because everyone's running to Beauty and the Beast in Tokyo Disneyland and they're running to Soaring in Disney Sea. So this is a good ride to buy a Premier Access Pass for and avoid that massive wait. All right, before I get any further into this video, let me give you some more concrete visuals for where these rides are actually located. So over in Tokyo Disneyland, there are seven lands. You're gonna enter the park through World Bazaar. And if you exit World Bazaar and take a left before reaching the castle, you'll wind up near Adventureland. Sound familiar? Just above Adventureland is Westernland, which I love that it's called Westernland. I think I call it Frontierland in this video somewhere, which is wrong. It is Westernland, my friends. And just above that is Critter Country toward the very back of the park. But if you were to take a right before the castle instead, you'd wind up in Tomorrowland, also familiar. Keep walking toward the back of the park from there and you're randomly gonna pass France because that's where Beauty and the Beast is. Can't explain it. Then you're gonna run right into Toontown after that and then Fantasyland. So that weird, but whatever, in the Haunted Mansion. So meanwhile, over in Tokyo Disney Sea, there are also seven lands you need to know about. The front of the park leads you immediately into Mediterranean Harbor where Soaring is located, but to the left, of that is the American waterfront area. The back left-hand side of the park will eventually lead you to Port Discovery, which is of course where Aquatopia is. But the very, very, very back of the park, more on the right-hand side, that's where you're gonna find Lost River Delta. The right side of Disney Sea is also home to Mermaid Lagoon and Arabian Coast, which are right up next to each other. While the heart of the park, that big old volcano, is Mysterious Island. Now, don't forget, Fantasy Springs is gonna be opening soon where you're gonna have Frozen and Peter Pan and Rapunzel Rapunzel uh, areas of that particular port. So that's going to be the eighth port there for Tokyo Disney Sea. So that's going to be coming right up in June 6th of 2024. Got all that? Good. Okay, now on to our regularly scheduled program. 
All right, next I'm talk about something that you'll probably make fun of me for, but that's okay. I am fully comfortable with that. Aquatopia might actually be my favorite ride in all of Tokyo Disney Sea. I can literally hear my video editor snickering while I say this, but I am not kidding. I love this ride. Aquatopia isn't like this revolutionary animatronic dark ride or epically thrilling coaster or anything. It's just a super silly trackless boat ride, kind of like a mousetrap coaster in the water. I don't know why I like it so much. Basically, anytime you ride it, you have to smile. There's just no way to ride this ride without laughing. And there's something to be said about rides like that. The vibes are really good. The lines are usually 30 minutes or less on average, unless it's a super busy day. And it's just good fun. So I would say if you get the chance to ride Aquatopia, definitely do it. And for those of you who think I am absolutely bonkers for including Aquatopia in my top 10, that's perfectly okay. We could agree to disagree. This ride is a blast. Last. Next up is Splash Mountain. Yep, it's still here. While Splash Mountain might have taken its final plunge in Disney World and Disneyland this year to start making way for the new Tiana's Bayou Adventure, Tokyo Disneyland's version is still going strong for now, and it's the only Splash Mountain left in the world. The ride is very similar to the rides in Disney World and Disneyland. There are a few different scenes, there are some funny characters that didn't get as much airtime in the other attractions, and of course it's all in Japanese so you don't really know what's going on. <laughs> But it's still fun, and if you're nostalgic for Splash Mountain, then Tokyo Disneyland is the place to go. Now, this classic log flume ride continues to be really popular in Tokyo. Again, this is one of the probably top three rides in Tokyo Disneyland, and you're gonna see those long lines all day long, especially on those super hot days. So it's best to either rope drop this one or purchase a Premier Access Pass for it. Now, before Enchanted Tale with Beauty and the Beast stole its thunder, Pooh's Honey Hunt was the big deal ride of Tokyo Disneyland. Pooh's Honey Hunt is a trackless dark ride where you'll board a honey pot and join Pooh on an epic yet whimsical adventure to find some honey of his own. Think of it as a cross between the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh that we have back at home and the new Beauty and the Beast ride in Tokyo. Once again, we got a ride filled with lifelike animatronics and impressive special effects and lots and lots of heart. The room everybody loves the most is the Tigger Room where you literally bounce with Tigger and it's just so fun. Now, the cool thing about Pooh's Honey Hunt, aside from it existing in general, is that it's part of the 40th anniversary Priority Pass program right now. Priority Passes are a lot like Genie Plus, but the free version, like like Fast Pass. While the most popular rides of the park won't be listed in the Priority Pass lineup because you will have to pay for those Premier Access Passes for the big rides, you can still use the Priority Pass on the day of your visit to book return times for many other rides that can still get rather lengthy queue lines. You can even book the same ride again if you want to, so who knows, maybe Pooh's Honey Hunt will be worthy of a second Priority Pass for ya. Now, that 40th Anniversary Priority Pass program is probably only gonna be around for the 40th anniversary year. It's kind of like a nostalgic return to that old free fast pass for the year. I'm not sure if it'll stick around or not. I hope it does because it's super useful. But if it doesn't, be aware if you go when the 40th anniversary is done, we'll see if they keep it around and just name it something else. Now, these priority passes work a lot like fast pass did. So you book your first one and then you either have to wait two hours or you have to ride the first one to book another one. Next up is Journey to the Center of the Earth. This ride is just bonkers. <laughs> It's a fever dream, which is why people love it. At the start of this ride, you load into a steampunk subterranean vehicle to get ready to check out the strange and bizarre world that Captain Nemo, the genius, not the fish, has unearthed. But like, when has a journey into the unknown ever ended up not being a huge drama fest, you know? So while you're exploring these cavern realms, suddenly you'll come face to face with a giant lava monster. Because by the way, you're in a volcano and this lava monster is just trying to protect her egg babies and your big old submarine looks way too intimidating for her liking, so she hates you, which means it's time for you to scoot, scoot, skedaddle on out of here at full speed. Oh, and remember that big old volcano I mentioned earlier? Yeah, that's Mount Prometheus, and that's where you're going to find Journey to the Center of the Earth. Lava monster, active volcano, it's all coming together. Since Mount Prometheus serves as the icon of Disney Sea, make sure to keep an eye on it because it's going to erupt from time to time throughout the day. So like the Rainforest Cafe volcano in Disney Springs, but on a much grander scale. 
Now, Bria tells me that Journey to the Center of the Earth is set up very similarly to Radiator Springs Racers and Test Track. I don't know if I believe her. She's sent me lots of videos to, to convince me. But for me, I probably still prefer Radiator Springs Racers to Journey to the Center of the Earth because there's actually a coherent story there. But Journey to the Center of the Earth, like I said, is just absolute bonkers and it's hilarious to ride. You're just like laughing the whole time thinking like what is happening right now? Plus journey to the center of the earth, whatever you can see of it is gorgeous and kind of unsettling and great for those who love experiencing the darker side of Disney Imagineering. But it's hard to piece together what's going on during this ride, especially with the language barrier. And even if you read the Wikipedia article about journey to the center of the earth, you still don't fully understand what's going on. And then the ride's suddenly over and you're still left wondering what on earth you just witnessed. Now, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, because of course all of these rides at the top tier of our list are gonna be on the top tier of everybody's list for the most part, except for Aquatopia, because I don't understand why people don't like that ride, it's incredible. But anyway, this is another good one to purchase the Premier Access Pass to skip the line. Just to get an idea for how much this one's gonna be, this will usually be about 1,500 yen. Uh, that's equivalent to around 10 to 15 bucks. Okay. Next up, Tower of Terror. Now, this is not the Tower of Terror you know back in Hollywood Studios. We've got a whole new storyline for the tower over in Tokyo Disney Sea. In Hollywood Studios, Tower of Terror follows the ill-fated elevator passengers who have fallen into the fifth dimension after the hotel was struck by lightning one Halloween night, basically focused on the Twilight Zone, right? But in Tokyo Disney Sea, Tower of Terror follows the story of Harrison Hightower, who is, again, part of the SEA, that Society of Explorers and Adventurers, and just so happens to look exactly like Joe Rohde, that is not an accident. That is 1000% on purpose. Anyway, Harrison brings back a cursed statue from his travels and it decides to go on a rampage, as cursed statues tend to do. The ride itself in Tokyo Disney Sea is much tamer than the one in Hollywood Studios or even Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout in DCA. So it kind of feels like Tower of Terror light when it comes to the actual ride. So that means if you can't handle Tower of Terror stateside, you might be able to handle this one. It's a lot less kind of tummy turning, I should say. But despite it being so much tamer, for some reason they have a five point harness. So you don't just have like one seat belt, you've got like a shoulder strap too. So just a heads up when you get on the ride, you're gonna have to put your shoulder strap on as well. And the cast member will yell at you if you don't, so make sure that you do that. So the big difference here is gonna be that pre-show where that statue kind of goes bonkers and the ride queue is really, really beautiful as well. So while the ride is based on the same sort of engineering premise, it's gonna feel like a totally different ride to you just because of the storyline. Now, one thing to look out for if you are a Joe Rohde fan, there are a lot of depictions of Joe Rohde around the exit and the gift shop and they're kind of weird, so keep an eye on those. Now, I like this ride, but I think I still prefer both versions over in the States. I think Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout is kind of, I will say, the best of the three. I know that you're gonna come for me on that one, Disney World fans, but I do think that's probably the best with overall theming and vibe, but the theming here is pretty incredible as well. And Tokyo Disney Sea has the upper hand on the exterior of this ride. The hotel's facade is sublime. It looks absolutely massive. So take many, many pictures and don't stop taking pictures. Fill up your whole camera with them. It's beautiful. And also just the whole the whole park is beautiful. Disney Sea is, I, I think what I kind of feel like when I'm there is that you've got a Disney park in front of you, but you've got even more theming behind the Disney park you can see. Like it's very hard to explain, but I feel like they've gone in layers here that you don't get in other parks. And I think that's what makes it so absolutely mind blowing. Plus the fact that it's literally right there on the ocean. So Tokyo Disney Sea, you can see the ocean from this park. It's almost an extension of the park the way they've built it. So that gives it even more depth. Now, Tower of Terror, you can also buy a Premier Access Pass for if the lines are looking way too intense for your liking. So that might be something you wanna do if you just have one day in this park. 
Next up, Indiana Jones Temple of the Crystal Skull. So Indiana Jones Temple of the Crystal Skull is at Tokyo Disney Sea. It's generally a very similar experience to what you're going to find in Disneyland at Anaheim, just with a slightly different storyline, a crystal skull rather than a forbidden eye. You'll get the high speeds, the jolty turns, the animatronics, the impending sense of doom, the massive cavernous room all of it. And it's a great time. But if you've ridden the one in Disneyland before, the two stories and ride mechanics aren't all that different from each other. It also has a similar ride set up to Dinosaur over in Disney's Animal Kingdom, though thanks to Disney's latest announcement about the Dinoland USA re-theme, which could include an Indiana Jones section, we're assuming that Dinosaur will transform into yet another episodic Indiana Jones ride too, but nothing's been confirmed just yet. Anyway, back to Tokyo, you can pick up a free priority pass for Indiana Jones Temple of the Crystal Skull to skip over the big lines for it. Oh, and also this is one of the very few rides in Tokyo Disney that has a single rider line. Now here's a little story from my trip. I was visiting on this date with three other people. Two of us had those 40th anniversary priority passes and two of us went ahead and used the single rider line because we wanted to see what would happen. Well, the single riders go pretty far along the same line as the priority access people and then they split off. And what actually happened is the single riders got through the ride faster than we did with the priority pass. So if you are not at Disney Sea on a weekend or on an extremely busy day, I would say go ahead and use the single rider line for this one because it's very possible it's going to be a lot faster. All right, moving on to Monsters, Inc. Ride and Go Seek. Now, don't assume that this Monsters ride in Tokyo Disneyland compares to the one you'll find in DCA. While both of them are themed after the popular Pixar film Monsters, Inc., Tokyo's version is a little bit more immersive. Much like how Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger Spin equips you with a blaster to shoot targets, Ride and Go Seek gives you a flashlight to help you spot hiding monsters and trigger little events with each new discovery. All in all, it's a cute little dark ride that you're not going to find in the domestic parks and you can snag a free priority pass for this one as well. Okay, so Fortress Explorations in Tokyo Disney Sea is technically not a ride, but it is such a cool attraction that's unlike anything we have in the States. So I really wanted to tell you about it. And frankly, it does hit my top 10. Fortress Explorations is an interactive walkthrough attraction that takes you through a medieval castle and inside these epic rooms featuring things like an ancient planetarium, miniature galleons you can pilot by remote control, a Da Vinci-like flying contraption, a massive sailing ship, cannons you can actually shoot, and so much more. And when you start to get hungry, this is also where you're gonna find Magellan's Restaurant, which is a table service experience inspired by renowned explorer Ferdinand Magellan. It features entrees and drinks inspired from around the globe. Now, don't worry, we've got a whole video all about the best Tokyo Disney food coming up on the DFB channel soon, so stay tuned. And Fortress Explorations can be visited at any time with no main queue waits or priority or premier passes necessary. And trust me, you're going to want to visit this one if you're here. While you're free to experience Fortress Explorations however you see fit, there is an interactive game here called the Leonardo Challenge if you want to become even more immersed in this amazing realm. You're going to receive a map with hints and clues that you'll have to uncover while making your way around this fort, and if you succeed, you'll become an official member of the SEA, which is my life dream realized. The map is mainly written in Japanese, but if you have the Google Translate app downloaded on your phone, you might be able to scan those map sections to have them translated for you. Ah, the wonders of technology. I use the Google Translator on the toilets all the time. All right, it's time for some honorable mentions. Now, I felt bad leaving some of these rides out of my top 10 list because a lot of them are out of the top 10 list just because they're exactly the same as they are back home. And that's not really fair to them, right? But I wanted to tell you about stuff that was different. Anyway, let's talk about the honorable mentions. So 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, that's like the tamer version of Journey to the Center of the Earth. Instead of being chased by an angry lava monster mama, you'll take a semi-leisurely ride in one of Captain Nemo's submarines to help him search for the underwater city of Atlantis. And as we're all completely aware by now, nothing ever goes wrong when we team up with that rapscallion Captain Nemo. Unfortunately, this ride was closed for routine maintenance when I was there, but the first time I ever visited Tokyo Disney Sea, I did get the chance to ride it. And I remember it being charming and intriguing and a little bit cramped. But it's still worth a ride through. Next is Sinbad's Storybook Voyage. It doesn't get enough love in my opinion. This is over in Disney Sea as well. It's a super adorable, slow going boat ride, kind of like 
like it's a small world, but following the story of Sinbad and his lovable tiger, Chandu, who has quite the fan base over in Tokyo. Like, Chandu in Tokyo is equivalent to the level of obsession Figment gets in Epcot, only Chandu gets a cute ride that's enjoyable. Anyway, Sinbad's not usually too long of a wait, so if the ride line is manageable, it's worth checking it out. All right, Nemo and Friends Sea Rider, this time we're talking about the fish, not the genius, is located in Tokyo Disney Sea as well, and it's one of those simulator movie rides where you'll shrink down to fish size and do fish things like swim and explore and say hi to the Finding Nemo crew. To be frank, I'm not a huge fan of Sea Rider, but I figured I needed to add it to the honorable mentions list because obviously lots of people disagree with me considering the line for this one can get super long. If you've got a Finding Nemo fan in your family, it may be worth the wait, but otherwise, if you find yourself missing out, it's not the end of the world. Okay, remember how Snow White's scary adventures had to be updated in Disneyland because the ending, where the evil hag crushes you with a boulder, was too much of a Debbie Downer? Well, if you're feeling nostalgic for the OG, terrifying version, Tokyo Disneyland's still got it. Hooray for nightmare fuel! Haunted Mansion in Tokyo Disneyland is a carbon copy of the Orlando version, but it does have the seasonal nightmare before Christmas overlay like Disneyland's in California has. So yeah, it's basically a mashup of the two and it's incredible. And finally, we got the Happy Ride with Baymax, which is one of Tokyo Disneyland's new rides along with Enchanted Tale of Beauty and the Beast. Happy Ride uses the same ride mechanics as Alien Swirling Saucers in Hollywood Studios and Mater's Junkyard Jamboree and Disney California Adventure. But I think because it's still so new, it's hugely popular in Japan. I wouldn't say it's an absolute must-do ride or anything, but it's still a good one for all ages and is pretty stinking cute. Now, personally, I did not wait in the line or buy a pass or anything to ride Happy Ride with Baymax because I could just stand outside it and film it. <laughs> and I've already ridden basically what it's like. So enjoy this incredible video of people riding this ride and having such a great time. And the cast members have a dance that they do every single time. And it's hilarious to watch and so much fun. Again, just a joyful experience. The Happy Ride with Baymax does have a premiere access pass if you're really wanting to know what all the hype is about, but you don't want to wait in a forever long line to figure it out. All right, let's talk duplicates. While Tokyo Disney has quite a few standout rides that are way different from what you're going to find in the States, they've also got quite a few cookie cutter rides that are the exact same thing you're going to find in the domestic parks too. I kind of liken their Tokyo Disneyland to a mashup of the Magic Kingdom and Disneyland in the States. And so it's kind of the best of both of those worlds kind of smushed together in Tokyo Disneyland. So you've got rides like Midway Mania, which is actually over in Tokyo Disney Sea in like a totally random Toy Story area. I don't know why it's there. Pirates of the Caribbean is in Disneyland. Roger Rabbit cartoon spin that's taken right out of Anaheim and that's over there in Disneyland as well. Several others which you can find listed on the Tokyo Disney website. While these rides are still top notch, there's no need to prioritize them since you can find the same versions back home. So I'd recommend doing all the most unique Tokyo experiences first, then backtracking to the dupes if you've got time. So I think it's really cool to see how Tokyo Disney's rides compare to the ones we've got back home because I'm a giant nerd that way. Now, I'm glad you got to experience them with me today. And if you enjoyed this Tokyo Disney special edition video, get ready because we've got more Tokyo Disney videos to come. We stayed at two of the Disney hotels. We stayed at Tokyo Disneyland Hotel in the character rooms and we stayed at Hotel Miracosta, which is currently the kind of high-end bougie hotel there in Tokyo Disney Sea, And it's located right inside Tokyo Disney Disney Sea, which is really, really cool. So we're gonna be covering that. We've got all of our food, tons of food in our food video coming up. We've also got a video where we're gonna tell you all the things I messed up on so that you can learn them before you go. And before you head out, don't forget to pick up our free Tokyo Disney digital guide for more domestic park and overseas comparisons over at disneyfoodblog.com slash Tokyo Disney. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching. This has been such a blast. I have so much fun talking about this new stuff that I'm learning about. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.